For him, it was just a game. Okay, we're back. We're live, and we're doing global connections right now. We're, we're studying uh, pandemic politics in the developing world here uh, with Carlos Juarez, who joins us from Mexico. Hi, Carlos. Nice to see your smiling and sunburned face. <laughs> yes, Jay. Managed to get outside today and got a little too much sun and didn't put my sunblock as, uh, you know, I always get scolded by my wife. And, uh, well, there you go. Uh, but it brings out the redness in me. You know, I have a little bit of Irish blood in my heritage, so um, kind of a chance to remind myself. Uh, but all is well and, you know, glad to reconnect, uh, you know, as we do often with these uh, opportunities to, you know, give some perspective. Here I am in Mexico City, and of course, uh, it is uh, undergoing a lot of, uh, well, a uh, peak, uh, you know, and, and like so many places, it's often hard to know what is the real data, what is the real information. Uh, Mexico has a very low, low percentage of testing going on. So in fact, uh, you know, they know that the numbers that they release officially are very undercounted. Uh, and more and more, I think what you have to find for the truth is you got to go to these uh, cemeteries or these, uh, I guess, places where they cremate uh, people. And, and those people will tell you, hey, these are busy days. It's a, it's a tough time. Well, you um, saw what happened in the U.S. yesterday when well, before, uh, Trump redirected all the COVID information. Ah, uh, yes, yes. He, he bypassed the CDC and mm -hmm. gave it directly to himself so sure. that he can tell you or not tell you, exactly. or he can lie about it, which is probably what he wants to do, and use it as a political weapon. But yes. we're not going to have the same level of confidence in the numbers anymore. That's right. And, and, you know, for this kind of crisis, it is a, first a health crisis. Yes, we have the economy, very important. But if you don't get this health crisis under control, uh, the economy is going to continue to stagnate and, and, and be pushed back, as we've seen now after several months, uh, opening too quickly, too soon, and now um, the challenge of that. And so you've got to get a handle on that health crisis. And what I want to really say about that is that that requires confidence in the government. And when we look around the world, which places have done better? it tends to be places where people have a, a level of confidence that the government is providing good information. They will believe, you know, the recommendations and follow them. The political leaders, we've talked about this before, you know, giving, you know, consistent uh, message and communication. Instead, when you have mixed signals or maybe denials or sort of, you know, downplaying it or politicizing it, people get very, very uh, nervous and skeptical. And, and of course, Mexico has a, you know, a long tradition of, uh, let's say, uh, skepticism and, and, and maybe criticism of the government uh, for many years, very you know, corrupt and, and, and maybe not accurate in its information. And, and it's hard to get rid of that legacy. Uh, but this is true, of course, everywhere, even the US with, with, of course, many mixed signals coming from the federal government, many people looking to their state and local authorities instead. Uh, so it's a real mixed bag. And the same happens throughout the world. Again, uh, some places, uh, even if you talk about India, this is a massive country, you know, that really in just a couple, four or five years, it's gonna surpass China to become the largest population. But India, a large place, but, you know, very di different regions. You have some places that are today peaking uh, and, and, and obviously challenging, but you have others. Uh, some time ago, there was a lot of reporting coming from the Southern state of Kerala, which has always been one of the more developed parts of India, even though it's, you know, it's a poor underdeveloped part of the world, but it is a very strong healthcare system. And again, people, who trust uh, the government and and uh, and have you know a sense of uh, I, I guess understanding to you know, to believe uh, when the authorities are telling them what they have to do. Uh, so that that's part of the challenge, I think. You know, I think there's a this is kind of a strange effect here. In in this country, um, people have long held the view that in developing world life does not mean that much that the death of an individual is just not that serious a matter in, in these developing countries. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, uh, you know, sort of an upside down kind of arrangement is that now, you know, we've lost 140,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, we have 3.3 or 4 million people who've been infected and there's gonna be a lot of deaths among that crowd. So uh, after you watch this for a while, for weeks and months, and you see those numbers tick up, and all these people. I mean, uh, how long would it take you and me counting as fast as we could count to count to 140,000? It would take a long time, and and so you say, well, oh yeah, these developing countries, life is cheap in these developing countries. How about in the U.S., where we don't seem to give a rip 
that 140,000 people have died a, a miserable, awful, lonesome death. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who's cheapening life, eh? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and of course, I think increasingly we're seeing now where people throughout the world are now, it's hitting home where people that you know that are in your family. Now, maybe just back to the developing world context, of course, in general, we speak about places where the family is the key institution. That is, people rely less on the state or on their employment for you know a safety net. It is the family that is the support network. And in many places, this is being disrupted because, uh, uh, again, just to, as a case in point in Mexico here, it's very similar in other parts of Latin America. A very high percentage of the population is in what we call the informal economy. That is, they live day to day. They may sell you know, a little you know, things they put out on the street that they'll sell, whether it's food or merchandise. That is, they're not in the formal employment. Now, given the crisis here, like everywhere, uh, formal employment has been hit hard. So many people who had regular jobs are losing them. Many of those are now trying to go into the informal economy, which is already sort of saturated. Uh, and uh, so it's a very, very tough situation. And here, uh, I, I think in general, what we see across Latin America, many of the poor families are facing an impossible choice uh, between obeying the quarantine measures or simply starving. That is, you've got to go out and make, you know, whatever you can get by for the day um, or, you know, despite the danger of infection. Uh, and, you know, I've just been observing it here, like in Mexico, in general, people throughout the streets you know, are wearing masks and trying to adjust and, and the government is trying its best to, you know, put it out. But at the end of the day, a huge population has to travel on public transport, the buses are packed, people are not wearing masks. It's hard to get around that. Not everybody has the luxury of a home where they can just camp out and be alone. Uh, and then you've got, a, again, because of the family and the tight uh, you know, social structure, a lot of multi-generational families. So you've got older people, lots of younger population, and that's a recipe for a real you know, disaster in some sense. Uh, so we're seeing, again, uh, throughout the region right now, of course, Brazil is the real high point. It's the second largest of, after the US in terms of both cases and deaths. Uh, and uh, uh, as well, about 10 days ago, we saw the president, Jair Bolsonaro, he, uh, he has tested positive, one of the first, you know, another head of state. I think he had another test yesterday. He continues to, to be uh, infected. But uh, this is one of the leaders who, of course, has been criticized because of a very lax response and denying it and, and also not showing uh, you know, use of masks himself uh, is taking a lot of criticism for that. So well, real you know challenges. Great leveler, great leveler. I mean, <clears throat> in the U.S., <clears throat> if you put somebody in the stress of a, a, a overpopulated household, mm -hmm. and then you put uh, that person in the stress of not having enough money and food, and no job and all, and no and no government benefits, which we are, which we have, and are getting more of that. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Well, in the individual case, you get domestic violence. Yeah. You get people roaming the streets uh, doing crime. Sure. Uh, you get, you, get uh, and, you know, and the Black Lives Matter was about Black lives, but it was also about people who couldn't stand being cooped up anymore. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, like, a, like, a, like a festering <laughs> bo boiling point, of course. Yeah, and I would bet you the same thing exists all over the world. Sure, I'm sure, sure the same kind of risk and, um, you know, uh, explosive possibility exists all over Latin America, South sure. America. No, absolutely. And, and here, again, just to give you some of the data that's come out now, the, the ECLA, it's called the Economic Commission on Latin America. It's a UN agency based in Santiago, Chile, which basically reports on, uh, on development issues, economic issues for Latin America. They are showing, uh, anticipating 45 million new extreme poor, you know, people that are, you know, basically in the last 20, 30 years, we've seen a, you know, a gradual decline of that, uh, of, uh, you know, allevi alleviating poverty. Uh, today, this crisis is pushing many, many more back into that extreme poverty. Uh, we also see a decline in the region uh, right now predicted to be about nine, over 9%. Nine uh, it will vary by country, but a pretty substantial decline. Already, again, places that are facing difficulty just before the crisis, uh, this is accentuating it. Then you have the situation with the United States because, uh, I'm sorry, with Mexico, because of its proximity to the U.S. because of the integration of the economies, it's interesting to see that, you know, the push by President Trump and different states of the U.S. to open and, and, and obviously get the economy going has also put a lot of pressure on Mexico, uh, in part because there is a real uh, interconnection and, and uh, particularly the, the reliance on many Mexican supply chains for the auto industry specifically. 
uh, there's been a lot of pressure put on Mexico to open those factories because the U.S. needs to get its economy going. So, um, in fact, uh, that political pressure uh, from Trump has also been put onto the Mexican president, López Obrador. Um, very interesting, uh, about what, a little over a week ago now, uh, the U.S. Uh, and Mexican presidents had a meeting in Washington. Uh, president López Obrador, uh, the first time he left the country now, in a year and a half, he's been in office, which is quite astonishing. Uh, not only that, but he actually flew on a commercial flight. Uh, he's a very uh, frugal and sort of, you know, left-wing populist. And one of the things he did when he first came into office was he wanted to, or he has tried to sell the uh, presidential plane from the previous president. Uh, they have a nice, uh, one of those uh, Dreamliner Boeing 787s, obviously a pretty yeah. expensive machine. Well, he refuses to fly on it and he actually flies commercial airlines. Yeah. So he had to take a flight uh, on Delta to Atlanta, transfer, go to Washington. I mean, here's the head of state of Mexico, uh, a place that has you know violent criminal organizations and, and everybody's already speculating, well, which flight is he gonna be on? There aren't that many flights these days. Not that hard to figure it out, uh, but he did the trip. He went to Washington. Very surprising how it was relatively under the radar, not a lot of attention. Uh, normally, this would have been a pretty big deal, a state dinner, you know, mm -hmm. and for both presidents, a chance to take attention away from the pandemic. Uh, and they went primarily to sign the, the trade agreement that went into effect July 1. This is the, the revised NAFTA, the U.S., Mexico, Canada trade agreement. Interestingly, uh, Justin Trudeau from Canada boycott decided not to go he you know the given the pandemic crisis and perhaps a, as a snub to uh, Trump himself so it was the Mexican and U.S. president signing you know this trade agreement um, a lot of criticism here in Mexico a lot of you know discussion because of course Trump comes to office or he launches his campaign five years ago with some pretty harsh words about Mexicans being rapists and the whole building the wall and a year ago we saw tremendous pressure from from Trump on Mexico to take on these caravans of migrants, right? And to seal the border. Uh, otherwise, he was threatening a massive tariff, uh, you know, war. So many saw uh, the Mexican president kind of going to sort of kowtow or maybe, you know, give, uh, give Trump more uh, credit, you know, more credit. Moreover, in a situation given the presidential election right now, it's almost like, why is he doing that? Why is he not choosing to meet with Joe Biden? Uh, why doesn't he just wait until the election kind of gets determined to, to decide? Uh, but again, it was a, it was a lot of uh, attention to that. Uh, but the leaders met, and again, uh, it was rather under the radar given so much other news, particularly about the pandemic and, and, and the economic uh, downturn in so many places. Quite well, I, you know, Trump controls the agenda. He controls the press on that sort of meeting. You know, he could mm -hmm. have made a Rose Garden love fest out of it or not. Mm -hmm. And it looks like not. Why? Why did he put the lid on it that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he tried to. In fact, they did have a signing ceremony at the at the at the White House there, and uh, uh, I found it interesting. You know, uh, Trump has a very famous signature. You know, very big and bold with his black pen, and the Mexican president was kind of small. And many people were looking at, well, there's the difference right there. You know, Trump has got to be big and bold, and 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 you know, he loves to show off the signing of it. Uh, but here again, uh, you know, the, the Mexican president and, and, and his team, obviously, they had to put the best spin on it. It was a way of showcasing their diplomacy and the president defending Mexico's national interest. But in the end, uh, it was, um, you know, this trade agreement, important as it is, kind of modernizing NAFTA, is not likely to have a huge impact right away. Uh, the, the two economies continue to be deeply integrated. That is not changing. But it goes back to what I said earlier, given the pressure in the U.S. to open the economy, that same pressure is being put on Mexico to keep the supply chain of, of parts. And, and, and you know, Mexico and the U.S. have a massive flow of trade that goes both ways. Uh, and uh, interesting that these two leaders, both of them populist, but from different maybe angles, Mexico's leader is a very left wing populist, very frugal, austere. Uh, Trump, of course, with his gold bathroom and maybe more, uh, you know, the billionaire lifestyle that he comes from. They are night and day, and yet they came together in a curious way to you know, celebrate this, this new agreement that's moving forward now. Well, that, that takes us to the whole notion of pandemic politics in mm -hmm. the developing world, the title of our show. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would like to ask you, you know, what kind of an effect is, the, is the, the pandemic having on politics? Is it elevating these populist uh, uh, or dictator type of... Um, Leaders, what is it doing? How is it yeah. changing the existing order? 
Yeah, I mean, there's no simple answer to that. I think it will vary. Of course, uh, leaders and, and, and the Mexican president, one of these, he was one who took a lot of time to sort of be denying it and pushing off and get, kind of making it seem as if it wasn't as bad as it has been. Uh, and so he's taken some criticism about that in the early stages in particular. He was he was very much in denial and, and you know, and so took criticism for that. Um, but I would say this, I mean, on one hand, I think it, 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 you see civil society beginning to question the government when, when they're seeing, you know, mixed results. The government is trying to downplay maybe the seriousness, whether it's in India, whether it's in Brazil and Mexico, uh, many different developing countries. Uh, I think what we see again and again is the role of social media. It can be valuable to give us information, but it can also spread a lot of misinformation there or, or distorted information. And it's often so hard for us to get good, accurate information. Moreover, in general, the developing world is a place where you don't see a whole lot of testing uh, you know, compared to you know, developed countries in the north. Uh, New Zealand, I think, has one of the highest percentages, uh, like South Korea. So uh, the reality is that the numbers that they do reveal are simply not true. And so a lot of people grow very skeptical about that. And, and it breeds a lot of uh, criticism uh, that the government is not being honest and, and upfront. Um, so again, it, it also accentuates already, you know, social tensions that have been there. Uh, you know, Latin America in particular is, is long characterized by a lot of inequality of, of income and, and, you know, racial and ethnic divisions. And uh, at the end of the day, the wealthier elites, more European, tend to have a, a, a bigger home, a second home, and have the ability to kind of weather this, obviously not worried so much about their income. Uh, the majority, the masses, are the ones who obviously are, you know, dependent on. You know, yeah, I, th I think you put your finger on something really important, and probably, and, and you talked about the people in Chile. I think about how mm -hmm. there are more people now. I mean, poor people coming around, um, mm -hmm. and so I, I think you know the, the whole experience in a given country, a given jurisdiction, accentuates disparity. Yeah, because mm -hmm. because COVID splits people. You know, you can afford to stay at home and not worry about work or food, yeah. uh, or you or you have to go to work and get in, get in a crowd and be concerned about being infected. That's a huge disparity. Sure. Yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. So it, it's kind of highlighting already things that have already been there. More generally, you could say if we look at the last twenty or thirty years in the developing world, in Latin America, many parts of Asia, um, in Africa, there's been a pretty substantial. Uh, improvement of, of quality of life that is the very poor I'm speaking a lot of that has has improved we're seeing with this crisis that many are kind of slipped back into that so we're, we're going to see a, a, a the very poorest are going to find themselves and and here you know the social tensions are going to flare up uh, as always happens they're going to take it out on the political leadership so you know we might anticipate in the next couple of years you know uh, uh, a lot of people looking at the response of their respective governments and saying you know you didn't do it and so they're going to want change there's going to be a pressure to get them out um, because unlike maybe a handle, you know, whether we look at some of the East Asian cases or, of course, uh, you know, New Zealand and, and, and the prime minister there that has been, you know, touted as a very successful model. Uh, those are places where the government is, let's say, gaining more, uh, you know, more popularity, more legitimacy. Uh, not not so in many of the developing countries. It, 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 it's going to be more likely to see pressure for political change. Mm. Well, it's a challenge in any country. Uh, in the United States, uh, Trump has not met the challenge. And uh, whether, whether his base agrees or not, the fact is, objectively, by the numbers, he hasn't met the challenge. But I'm, I'm happy to hear that in other countries, maybe not a lot of other countries, that people feel the government has met the challenge. And that's very interesting because that, that is a political, a political expression of how, how the coronavirus works in a given society. If people yeah. come away with, a, with a more confidence in the government, a better yeah. feeling about their leadership, that is really something to be studied. So yeah. why is it? Why is it? What happens in those developing countries where people feel greater confidence in the government? They like yeah. the way they, What is it? What, are, what can we learn from them? You know, here, and, and maybe I, I, I'm going to cite the example here in Mexico, that while the president has often taken a lot of criticism for being, you know, aloof and maybe not taking it as seriously, there is an individual who is like the, the main sort of, you know, COVID czar, uh, a public health professional who daily is presenting, you know, information. And, uh, and so I think a lot of it is that ability to convey, you know, 
good information data and kind of reassure people. Uh, and, and this particular leader that I'm, 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 I'm mentioning, uh, uh, he has, you know, well, like everything, he's got some, some detractors, but in general, he is seen as a very serious scientist who's kind of giving, and I think as people see that, they, they begin, just as you might in the U.S., I mean, we see the debates in the U.S. over, you know, Dr. Fauci, and now he's being sidelined by the president, but to the extent that you have uh, leaders, political leaders, and, and public health professionals who are leading the, the dialogue and, and giving the direction, I think people will follow that. I, I mentioned uh, in Southern India, the state of Kerala, this was a, again, not, it's a bit of an anomaly, but it's a place where people have trust in the local government because they have a healthcare system, again, even in a developing country that has been quite, uh, you know, quite solid, quite effective um, and innovative. Um, the other thing is that countries in the, in the developing world don't have the resources. They don't have the cap you know, capabilities of, uh, of, of maybe first world countries. So they have to be a resourceful. They have to be, you know, more innovative in some ways of how to do that and you know different examples everywhere either you know learning how to create you know temporary hospitals or uh even developing you know new equipment on their own and not depending on the outside world uh so we see some of that i think what we're going to see a real challenge in the coming you know six twelve months once we begin to see vaccines and a program to you know address that it will be a challenge because the, there's going to be a race and, and the U.S. and the wealthy European countries are going to have more power and capability to, you know, do that in their own. Uh, and for the poor developing countries of sub-Saharan Africa, poor countries in Central and you know, parts of South America, you know, who is going to help cover that cost? Is the U.S., is Europe going to help to you know, develop that? Because in the end, this is a global issue that uh, for Europe and the U.S. cannot be solved unless we also address it in the developing world. You can't expect no. them to do it on their own. I know this is a, is a long shot, but um, this reminds me of manganese nodules. Um, at the ocean bottom around the world, mm -hmm. there is an incredible storehouse of manganese in the form of nodules. Mm -hmm. The problem is um, that, that people have to learn how to collaborate to mine them. Sure. Um, sure. And uh, that hasn't happened yet. It's, yeah. it's every, every country for itself. Yeah. Um, and, and the international rules don't, you know, nobody respects them. And it's a problem that because sure. it, ultimately it'll be damaged to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same thing here. Are, are, there, are these countries actually collaborating or are they not? In the yeah. beginning, um, several months ago, Trump was found to have tried to um, suborn um, a German uh, pharmaceutical research company mm -hmm. that was working on a vaccine and he was trying to pay them billions and mm -hmm. trying to steal away cockroach their their best, um, you know, uh, medical researchers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Angela Merkel stepped in and said, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> and and the right. researchers, to their credit, the researchers themselves said, no, 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 we're not doing that. But what Trump was trying to do is he was trying to get the thing on a, na a nationalistic basis. He was mm -hmm. trying to get it out of Germany and into the United States where he would not share it. Maybe he'd try to make money on it. It's hard yeah. to say where that billion was going to come from that he was going to use to pay them off. Sure. Um, so now we have this, a similar situation with Putin, who is, who is hacking into mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, vaccine research uh, facilities uh, yeah. in the U.S., in the U.K., and, and other places, yeah. and trying to get a, 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 an advantage. And I think there's a race, like with the manganese nodules, there's a race to see who can get their hands on this thing, yeah. because everybody realizes that if you have to give it to 9 billion people over and over again, uh, you know, the initial dose would be a, a, a couple of doses. Um, and then we don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, we're, before you need another one, another, another regimen. And so there may be many shots times 9 billion people. Yeah. Okay. And that's going to mean a lot of money, a lot yeah. of money. So the stakes are high, and I think there's a competition going on, and it is a nationalistic, isolationist yeah. kind of competition. Yeah. No, I, along those lines, I think what we are seeing, and, and it follows this pattern of, a, um, in many ways, a, a challenge to the liberal international order that we've had for so many decades, after World War II, cooperation, coordination, um, you know, even post-Cold War, by, you know, the 90s, 2000s, the world was more or less cooperating more, growing regionalism, of course. But this pandemic now, I think, has shown uh, people or countries, maybe in this case, are kind of turning inward and, and looking out for their own interests, a more of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Uh, and this is characteristic of, again, a, a rejection of multilateralism, 
very pronounced, of course, in the U.S. under Trump, uh, but also a challenge of cooperating. But uh, the Europeans, instead, in general, still, you know, obviously have the capacity, and, and maybe they have a, a long tradition of coordinating policies. But even in the peak of, of the crisis, we saw a lot of countries kind of left on their own or, or looking, you know, without having help from some of their neighbors. Uh, but boy, this is one of those cases where, in the end, certainly the public health experts will tell you, you cannot do this on your own. You need to be coordinating with what's happening in other countries, given the mobility. Now, right now, things are slowing down in terms of travel, but the mobility of people and, and the movement of goods and, and, and commerce, all of that spreads not only goods and people, but also disease. And so these uh, pandemics, we've known that they were going to be here with us for years and they are going to be continued challenges in the future. Today it's COVID-19, you know, in five or 10 years, there may be others. Uh, ultimately, let's hope that we can draw some lessons for this, both the shortcomings of not cooperating, but also the lessons that we can learn and, and, and help, you know, different countries uh, get over this. Carlos, you say lessons. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we are, we may be aware of these lessons, but whether we are actually implementing these lessons is another question. Sure. And, um, you know, like for example, when, when, when uh, Trump says, I'm not going to support the UN, uh, when he shoves off from the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. it's, it's more than just the money. It's more, than, it's more than even just one country being nationalistic. He's sending a message around the world, let's not collaborate. And yeah, it yeah, damages absolutely. one organization in the world that tries to collaborate among nations, the United Nations. Sure. So, you know, what's, I think the damage is extraordinary. It's far beyond what it seems to be. And my sure. question to you is, are we getting closer to learning and implementing that lesson or are we getting further away? Well, yeah, I think, as you said, I mean, I don't think at this point we're drawing those lessons. I mean, uh, there will be, you know, an effort to reflect and, and try to draw that out. Uh, but I think just as you suggested right now for the U.S. and its role right now exiting the World Health Organization, I mean, this is just seen by everybody as a disaster. This is not the time to do that. No, there may be reforms the, w, the WHO needs to make or the U.S. can, you know, somehow address those. But ultimately, again, th this is not the time to be running away from that and trying to solve this on your own. Uh, I think it, it, it underscores uh, a view of the United States as, you know, the country that we used to look to as the leader uh, and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, you know, founded what, maybe in the late 40s. This was always the top, top uh, public health agency of the world. Today, it's losing credibility. Uh, it's been politicized. And just the, the announcement you said at the outset, where now Trump administration is going to be having hospitals report directly to HHS, bypassing CDC. That is a politicization of a politicization, if I can use that word, but basically uh, it loses credibility. Uh, and uh, again, CDC has long been sort of like the hallmark of this is how you organize a public health agency. Uh, today, it's looked at a, you know, less uh, as, as the, the model. Uh, yeah, and, look, so. and look at Fauci. I mean, he's been working a campaign against Fauci. And Fauci, I mean, most people recognize Fauci as authoritative and credible, but if he keeps on doing that, you will see Fauci's name erode. Repetition is the mother of study. If he keeps on attacking Fauci, has his minions attacking Fauci, in a week or two or three, Fauci will, will look so good. Just yeah. the way Trump works. Sure. So anyway, we, we only have a minute or two left, and I wanted to offer you the opportunity to try to come to some kind of general conclusion about the effect of the pandemic on, on politics, both on a, on a national level and on, a, on an international level. What would you leave with people as a takeaway, Carlos? <laughs> well, I think it, it, it's simply accentuating things that have already been happening, whether it's in inequality, injustice, you know, domestic violence, uh, these kind of issues. Even increasingly, we're seeing you know, uh, you know, uh, things like the drug uh, cartels here in Mexico. They haven't stopped operating and doing what they do. Uh, and we have still high levels of insecurity so it, in some ways, it's exacerbating a lot of what is already there, increasing the disparities. Uh, it's a real challenge. Uh, having said that, I will say this, I think there are also many examples, and we often don't see enough of them at the micro level, you know, small communities kind of coming together. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the, of, the, of the pandemic, we spoke about this idea, well, you know, people are getting to know their neighbors and, and for the first time, and that, uh, maybe not enough of that has happened. But, but I do see in many places a sense of, 
this has been a game changer, clearly a paradigm shift. So people now have to start thinking more about their local immediate communities because well, they it's, not, it's a normative thing. Sure. But at the end of the day, Carlos, my, my last question to you, we almost out of time. Will this kind of disruption, this kind of, um, uh, what do you want to say, this kind of new politics, new politics locally and globally, will it lead to war? There, I, I think not so much between nations. In fact, the days of interstate wars is, is pretty much behind us. Within some places, yes, you're going to see tensions and divisions, again, exacerbating those differences. Uh, and, you know, even you can see in the U.S., I mean, the, the racial, uh, you know, injustice and so on has been exacerbated. Uh, and people, the pandemic has just created tension and, and sort of a boiling point so that other issues now are suddenly going to be coming up. So I, I, I do see them the tensions and violence, but more within states and, you know, and within regions, not so much between countries. Although, again, the United States, I think this crisis has further alienated and pushed the U.S. outside of the global leadership. Uh, and well, yeah. Well, and part, of, part of the reason for my question is our, mm -hmm. our, our degraded relationship with, uh, with China. Mm -hmm. You know, for, to, from, say, before Trump till now, our relationship with China has essentially uh, come apart. Yes. And it's uh, really worse every day. And uh, China is nobody to be trifled with. Uh, whatever the pandemic may be, yeah. they are a strong and uh, economic economic power. Mm. Um, so I, I worry about that. And, sure. and, 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 and you're right. I mean, there, there are changes in the world. And you wouldn't see a classical war either. You'd mm. see some other kind of war, mm. uh, a, a trade war, which mm. we're in already. Um, and maybe uh, a, a uh, electronic this, war. Yeah, the cyber war, what you cyber mentioned war. earlier, uh, the yes. Russians hacking into, you know, now all this stuff. I mean, they're just wanting to muddy the waters and, and confuse yeah. everybody more. Yeah. That's a sad situation. Well, we'll clarify it. I know we will. In a couple of weeks' time, we're going we're gonna to wrestle with these issues <laughs> as they have evolved, and we'll clarify it for the benefit of you, me, and anyone watching. <laughs> That's right. Great. Well, Thank always you, a great, uh, always great to reconnect and share some thoughts on this never-ending, changing world. But uh, <laughs> thank you again, Jay. Thank you again, Carlos. Aloha. Aloha.